I know it and more locks. Um, I apologize. Sorry guys, but we're just, we're doing this. Um, this is the last video on locks. I promise. And even I can't believe we're still talking about these things, but judging from the response I got under the last video in the comment section, there's still a lot of interest in these things. And I even, I don't know where it's coming from. I didn't anticipate this to even be a thing, but apparently it is. So, you know, I've been able to tell from the comments that there's two very distinct camps on this subject. The first camp is like, I don't know what the big deal is. It's a mass produced little stamped out piece of metal that has tabs that get bent up to resist counterclockwise rotation. That That's all there is enough said, we, we can move on already. The other camp is like, I have so many questions. So um, basically it's just gonna be easier for me to make a video rather than type out two or three evenings worth of responses, basically answering the same question over and over and over again. So that's what I'm gonna do. Uh, if you need to click away, if you're over it, you're done with it, please do so now. I have plenty of other playlists, videos, things that may that, that may be worth, you know, checking out. Um, if not, stay tuned and hear what I have to say. So we've got an entire bench full of locks. You guys are familiar with these rectangular ones. There's some nice old Cosmoline sticking a bunch of these together, some good new old stock. And the clover leaves that we've been using recently, but there's also some of these kind of more diamond shaped ones. We got round ones like for flywheels. We have these uh, rectangular ones for pinion sleeves, these ones for bell housings, larger ones for larger flywheels. And then we got like these for fans, which there's kind of a lot going on there. And I, I'm glad I don't have to try and make any of those, but, um, had a lot, a lot of questions about these in the comment section under the last video, like I said. So we'll jump right into them and I'll try and answer a few of these questions in short order. We have Alan Harney. He asked, Squatch, are fold-over locks common in modern diesel or gas engines? None that I work on. The last time I encountered fold-over locks at the dealership, my real job was on early, early to early mid 90s. Uh, International Navistar 6.9 liter indirect injected diesels and then the 7.3 liter indirect injected diesels which were basically bored out six nines. They had some full over locks on some of the exhaust manifold hardware and a few other components but really that was about it. Nothing I work on or see for it at all now. I mean for decades, for at least 20 years have really had any full over locks at all. Joe Kano says, I thought you already did a really good job of explaining the fold over locks. What I'm curious about is how you got them bent so neatly working through the access holes in the gears. Is there clearance to get behind them with a punch? The Niwo says. I know a lot of fold over lock requests slash questions, but I really would like to see how you fold over the locks through those access holes. And to round it out, 54321 Dan Fox. Cutting right to the chase, if you get another opportunity to show us how one of those might be installed underscore through a hole in a covering assembly like a gear underscore, I would be very interested. I just don't see how to bend one up and or down while it's at the bottom of a hole. So we're talking about the clover leaves again. Uh, the reason why I didn't do any filming of the locks that are beneath these gears, and you can see in there, there's the bolt and the lock, everything's folded, is because they are so darned inaccessible. So when I have a wrench in here or I'm bending up those uh, tabs with a screwdriver or a pliers, you're not going to be able to see any of what I'm doing on camera anyway. That's why the one I filmed was on this hub here completely exposed. You can actually see what's going on there. That being said, I used a slightly different process on this hub than I did for under the gears. We will discuss that in a minute, but to get these locks installed under the gears, I'll just do a quick rundown of what happened. Now we're only worrying about the tab that gets folded up against the bolt. I will talk about the tab that gets folded down when I'm finished here. So once the bolt is in place and tightened in, I just go back to the old 90 degree screwdriver tool. Now granted, there's not a lot of room to get in here and work, but as I've said before, these clover leaves are pretty good about having their little wings kind of pre-bent already so you can get under them e more easily. You can take this gear and rotate it down so that your 90 degree screwdriver tool can fit in here and start getting under that wing and start to pry. You can also hold this gear stationary so that it can be used as a point to leverage off from and get that uh, lock tab started on its way up a lot easier. Once the lock tab gets pretty close, I used like uh, longer flat needle nose uh, pliers like this 
and you could work right in there get around each side of the bolt get on the lock and just go and get those things nice and bent everything's tight boom boom you're done repeat until you've been all the way around and now for the part about the tab that gets bent down we'll go to a comment left by michael scriffiano Michael asks, why can't you bend the one tab first, then tighten the bolt and bend the second tab? Just ask him. Well, that was a good question. I've already answered it in the comment section, but I wanted to use it as a demonstration for how I installed those locks that were beneath those gears. I did indeed pre-bend those initial lock tabs that get folded down before I put them under the bolts and put those gears in that engine. But I cheated a little bit. The beer can engine is saving my day again. I have... Uh, this hub from the accessory drive gear that uh, came from that unit and I'll show you how I pre-bent those bend down tabs on those locks. We have a reused clover leaf under here. It's not good for anything other than demonstration at this point anyway. I flattened it back out and the way I pre-bent them was I used a uh, 3 8 bolt with a nut and basically tightened it in so the lock cannot move. This is where it is going to be in its final position upon installation. And I pre-bent that tab down just like that. Um, I did the same thing for the cam with this thrust plate out of the beer can engine cam. Uh, same strategy, short 3 8 bolt with a nut, uh, clamp that thing on there really well, and then bend that tab on down. Now the reason I was so fussy in bolting those locks down to components that were just like the ones they were going to eventually be on was to get the most accurate locations possible for those bends. So say we bent this tab too far down, it is going to bottom out on the edge of that plate before the bolt holes line up. You can't get a bolt in there, it isn't any good. Or, say we line up the bolt holes, but like we have here, the bend is way too far out, that's still going to allow for some movement under that bolt, which again is no good. So if we pre-bend them on components that are just like what they're going to end up on, you're going to end up with the best fit possible under very, very tight working conditions. So I installed the bolt and a lock with a pre-bent tab, ran it down finger tight, made sure that tab was located where I wanted it to be. But since the drag of the bolt is still sufficient to carry that lock with it and straighten that tab back out and misalign the whole thing, I had to find a way to wedge that lock from turning. So the best way I could do it, and again, you're not gonna see all of this because it's such tight, confined spaces, was I had the ratchet with the socket on the head of the bolt, and then I could take this screwdriver, come in alongside the socket, get down on that lock tab and wedge everything in through that access hole. And that is one, um, that's one instance where having this tight confined space really worked to my advantage because once I filled that whole access uh, hole up with tools, there was really nothing else that was gonna move, but it still allowed me to hold that lock tab in place with the screwdriver as I turned with the ratchet and socket and tightened in that bolt. And from that point on, I've already showed you how I bent up the second tab. So to make a long story short, uh, a lot more work went into fitting those lock tabs underneath these gears than it did to fit the tabs here in the wide open. The reason I showed you the one in the wide open is because it's the only one I could show you on camera. Uh, there's so much going in through those holes, you weren't gonna see anything anyway. And it's also kind of to illustrate the point that in mechanics, a lot of different methods can be used to accomplish the same task. And service manuals will often tell you install this component. Well, it is up to the person that's doing the job to decide what the best method of accomplishing that task is going to be. Um, like with these locks, it, just because I showed you the one method does not mean that is the only method that one can use and that is the only method that I did use. It's just that I need to try to balance going into great detail so that people that are not as familiar with mechanics still know what is going on, but acknowledging the fact that I cannot show you every single detail that there is involved in a job at the same time. I mean, my videos are already two to three times longer than what I would like them to be in a perfect world anyway, and most of that is because I talk just as much as I actually wrench on things. And I, I realize that a lot of the in-depth descriptions of the things I'm doing tend to dissuade more experienced, you know, mechanics from watching all of that because for them it's like tying your shoes, you know, but my goal with the videos is to put out the type of information that I wish I would have had access to back in like 1999 when I was just out of high school. I bought my grandpa's old D2 and I decided I needed to start wrenching on it. At that time, I bought a service manual and a parts book and that's pretty much the extent of the information that I had. Everything else I had to figure out on my own. So if I can convey some of what I've seen and some of the things that aren't 
explicitly descript, described in the manuals. If I can give like some sort of a visual record of what you can expect to get into when you're in these things or how to accomplish some of these tasks, that's my main goal. I'm not trying to impress the guys that are, you know, career along mechanics. I mean, there's a lot of guys that watch the channel that know a lot more than me. Uh, it's, it's always gonna be that way. So to finish up with the fold over locks completely, and we're not coming back to this topic again, we'll uh, go to Jungle Johnny 1000. He asked, do you ever just chuck the fold over locks and replace them with some simple lock washers? That seems so monotonous, but maybe I don't understand. Well, that's, you know, I, I completely understand where you're coming from there. Uh, my thing with the fold over locks is, honestly, I love them because it's part of what makes a D2 a D2 in my book. And if I find components that are in the parts manual, I want them to end up on my D2. So I know that this is kind of a drastic comparison, but we'll just, we'll use it anyway. Say we discard full over locks with more efficient means of retention, like Loctite, lock washers, what have you. Sure, they might work as long as they don't provide, you know, create clearance issues and whatnot. But at the same time, at what point do you stop upgrading machine before it ceases to be the machine that it used to be. So like redoing this engine, we don't have easy access to things like new pistons or bottom end bearings or things like that anymore. So let's just, well, let's just pull that engine out and just swap it out with the Cummins. I mean, yeah, good quality engines, we can probably make an adapter plate bolted to the rear end, it'll, it'll fit. Now we don't have a pony motor, we're, we're down to electric start now and it's so much more convenient, it's so much more this and it's streamlined and it's that. But, at that point, you don't really have a D2 anymore in my book. Um, and I know that's, like I said, quite a drastic comparison when you're just talking about swapping out a full over lock with a lock washer. But that's what makes a D2 a D2. And it's that hand fitting of those components, you know, trying to find the best possible combination of bolts that locate well with the fold over tabs. You get just perfect ones like that one and like that one and like just about every one that was under that gear, which you can't even see right now, which is a kind of a total injustice. But being able to hand fit pieces together like that, in my book, that's kind of how, it's kind of how you impart a certain amount of your, of your soul, for lack of a better word, into an engine. And that's kind of what gives an engine like this D3400 its own kind of style and class and, just it's it's just kind of a neat aspect of it and and kind of your workmanship is basically your signature and your name is as only as good as as your signature basically so you know how you how you hand fit something how you assemble something like these fold over locks or like that packing in the uh beside the rear main cap that's basically like your signature and it gives the next person that goes into work on that engine a pretty good idea of other things that they can expect to find while they're in there. Because if you took as much time to fit full over locks and make them as nice as you possibly could, chances are the rest of what's in that engine is going to be along those same lines. But if you pull out like some old mangled thing like this or like this, that's going to give you also a pretty good idea of everything else you're likely to find in an engine more often than not. Anyway, I probably butchered that, but I hope you get the idea. Um, we need to wrap this up. I can tell we're kind of dragging on again. So I just want to hit on one more comment. We have Wayne Rogers. He says, don't know how you can remember where and how everything goes. Wow. And then Paul Silva follows it up with books. <laughs> And it is true, I have a lot of books. I have a lot of manuals. Um, it's a necessity to have good servicemen's reference manuals, good parts manuals, uh, good uh, technical service bulletin manuals, if you can find them, all of that stuff. I mean, I've built like a miniature library and I don't have nearly what some people have for like reference material, tech manuals, stuff like that. But I have everything that covers every machine that I have, every attachment for that machine and other machines outside of those serial number ranges to act as kind of interchange references to know what parts machines can lend parts to projects that I'm working on. It's an absolute must. I mean, there's been guys on the forums asking lots of questions and trying to fix stuff. They don't have books and I'm not knocking them for trying, but if you're gonna really get into something and really do it well, you need to have the books, the manuals, the reference material. It's a must for everybody. And also these D3400s are pretty basic uh, when you get down to it. Um, when you reference these things to what I encounter in my real job. Well, this is my real job and all of that. 
and all that and everything that should be in that hole down there everything that should be in that hole down there and all that stuff and that piece and that special tools all the stuff back here this thing here that's my job and this don't need to dial in care know if that's bad and that and the rest of these pieces here brings us back to my job after witnessing that I think you understand why I just love falling locks <laughs> it's just downright therapeutic you know and the new stuff it's it's well and good but give me old stuff any day I battle that new stuff every day it's a constant struggle it fails I mean it's it's been designed with planned obsolescence it only has one lifespan this d3400 this thing was built to have basically as many lifespans as could fit into one good engine block and I mean some of these machines have been rebuilt over and over and over again and they're still around running none of this new stuff's going to be around when it's 80 years old are you crazy i mean it's just i don't like electronics i don't like newfangled fancy things it's like tortoise in the hair okay a d3400 is not going to outwork any brand new cat but you give me something that i can buy once i can rebuild once if i have to and i can run that thing for the rest of my life it might not be the most efficient it might not be the classiest it won't be the fastest it doesn't have to be if it lasts forever sign me up man that's the one i want so I, I've always been instilled with the value of, you know, money's hard enough to come by. If you're going to buy, buy once and cry once, you know, I, I just, I don't, I don't like buying things with the intention of ever having to replace them. We'll put it that way. To me, that's just, it just doesn't make any sense. But then again, I don't really fit in this world that well either. Anyway, I've talked enough. Hopefully you guys know where I'm coming from with the full over locks, why I like them and you know, it was just another means of retention that Caterpillar used and a lot of other companies used for decades. And, you know, they worked. They're more labor intensive to, to fit and to assemble. And that's kind of why they fell out of favor because everyone likes quick, speedy, efficient assembly lines and, and whatnot. But, you know, right now they're kind of a, they're kind of a novelty more than anything, but they're going to go back in all of my engines. I always have fun with them. Anyway, guys, we're not talking about fold over locks ever again. Thanks for watching. I need to get on to other things. Tune in again next time.